This is the How Did I Get Here podcast, and I'm your host, Ryan Poli. This is a conversation I had with my friend, Shola Olun Loya. He's the owner of Studio Kitchen in Philadelphia. First of all, Shola, thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Are we ready to go? Yes. Preston. Yeah, yes. excellent. I'm excited um, to be here. Uh, we've known each other for a while now. We have. I yeah. Mean, we met by, I'm not sure, serendipity, coincidence. We met at the Catbird Suit, I think. Yes? No, we met before that. No, no, no. That's right. Because we met I before. knew you. That's yeah. why I came. How do we meet? Uh, Scott Manlin. Saw that I was traveling. Yes. Put us in contact. Yes, Chicago. It was Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was here, put us in contact, yes. and then we went to we dinner. Met. And then you're like, hey, we're going to go to Alex Talbot's house and hang yeah. out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. Um, but you have a super interesting story. You you grew up in the UK, or you were born in Nigeria, grew up in UK, the UK? Well, I grew up mostly in Nigeria, to be honest with yeah. you. But I had enough benefit of going. Um, Got it. Something's wrong with this, man. This is like the third time this happened today. No, that's okay. It just needs a little yeah. tweak. It was my fault. Yeah. So, growing up in Nigeria, uh-huh. however, you know, not necessarily wealthy, but mm-hmm. well-to-do Nigerians had a good connection and the economy was enough to support a middle class that most families could travel for summer vacation mm-hmm. to the UK. And also as someone who's, my, my father was inherently connected to the UK before I was born. Like my father went to Cambridge University mm-hmm. and went to University of St. Andrews in Scotland and also kind of um, taught at Oxford University. So I, when he was doing his fellowship, I lived with him for some time okay. in Oxford. But we mostly lived in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. We just like, every summer, we could just like, you know, Americans go to like, Cape Cod for the summer. Yeah. We go to London. Right. <laughs> so. Same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and because Nigeria was a British colonized place. It, w- it was easy for you to get back It was back very and easy forth. to go yeah. back and forth. And okay. the, the only, f- the majority foreign influence in Nigeria was British. Correct. So, so many people spoke English, even though it's an African country. Mm-hmm. You could communicate in both native languages and English. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the childhood in Nigeria like? Childhood in Nigeria was great. You know, I was, you know, Nigeria is separated into three categories of people, I would say. And this is just my opinion. Mm-hmm. The wealthy, the educated, and the poor. Yeah. Most of the wealthy are not ex- extremely educated in the finer points of like mm-hmm. precision of you know super education, Harvard, Cambridge, MIT, that kind of stuff, yeah. McGill University. They go to schools in Nigeria and they do whatever they do. Uh, but they're the elite. They're connected to the government. They get like special contracts, they mm. become really wealthy. Right. So these are the kind of people who like in a developing country still will have like $4 million houses, private right. jets and boats. Were they connected before the education or were there some sort of connection? No, they with, connected with, before the education with, by family, wealthy, by, by connections. Family money. Yeah, yeah not okay. even so much family money, uh-huh. but like privatization access, you know, in the same way that they, they were never, they, they were never oligarchs in Russia mm-hmm. until Boris Yeltsin gave the country over to right. Putin. Correct, yes. Which basically is what happened. Right. So in Nigeria, in the transference of like from military rule to civilian rule, some people benefited greatly from Correct. that. And those who were in, not cahoots per se, but had access to mm-hmm. the military dictatorships were able to amass have, great wealth. Have a leg up. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. You know, so that's how it works. Yeah. But then the educated are not poor, but mm-hmm. they're highly educated. Like my father, for example, is someone who went to what is potentially one of the best universities in the world mm-hmm. as my uncle. Like my uncle came to the United States and went to Harvard at McGill University and MIT. Yes. Three. Like Jeez. crazy. Wow. I could not even like aspire to be any of these people. Yeah. <laughs> but these were like my two role, role models growing mm-hmm. up, which is why I have this introduction to both jazz and classical music uh-huh. as formative music ideas in my head, not just for like cultural things, but also for process. And if you notice in my post, I reference a lot of music. You do. That's, I love it. I'm a big music buff myself. Exactly. So, yeah. that, that's how my reference was, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so, and then the poor are like the average people in every developing country who are just hustling, trying to, it's not that they don't aspire too much, but the, the first two classes, but mostly the upper class hasn't really passed down wealth to, to support infrastructure and making a better society. Like Nigeria has as much money as like the UAE, Mm -hmm. you know, there's no reason there should not be a Lagos Formula One. Right. There's no reason there should not be like all the fancy buildings in Dubai, Uh you know, granted there's some issue with how they use like foreign labor, Mm -hmm. but still Nigeria like makes like 
several hundred million dollars a day in oil revenues. Yeah. There's no reason like this money isn't trickling down to like at least a smooth road, right. you know, a grocery store, consistent mm-hmm. electricity, consistent water, right. sewage treatment. So that's that part of it is everything. Everything a, a, a first world country would have, I'd say. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nigeria can afford it. It yeah. just does not get to mm-hmm. the finish line. So that part of it is frustrating. But I left before that became more acute. As you know, I, I went back about four months ago after not being in West Africa for about 25 years. Yeah, I saw that. And it was ha- I was happy to see family, certainly, and, and connect with local cultures. But it was appalling to see how much lack of development there was. Really? That was demoralizing, you know. And so it's kind of inspired a, a wave to think that all of us Nigerians who left to go to the West and just kind of essentially abandon the country, even though that's not our intent, really need to sort of, you know, I hate to use the word lean in because it's just a cliche, yeah. but have to Pay make attention. some commitment to, mm-hmm. to, to being part of that conversation moving yeah. forward. Mm-hmm. And so for me, at least from a cultural perspective and competence perspective, in, in terms of the way African food, Nigerian food, in a more local sense, and Yoruba food, which is the cultural specific region food of where I'm from, mm-hmm. can be proliferated into a Western and a world concept with some degree of authenticity. And maybe maybe there's a transference of how I can create some sort of infrastructure that people in Nigeria who are cooking authentic Nigerian food can benefit from like sort of like the profit structure that you would do it with in the West. Right. You know, like I just came back from CIA's World of Flavors. The focus was Africa. It was a fantastic conference. Lots of expert African chefs in America who are made their best efforts to cook brilliant, delicious West African food. But I also want to see like people come from West Africa to show what that cultural cuisine is from. Yeah. It's a tedious process because, you know, we look at so many things in the world today as a zero sum game. You understand that term? Like it doesn't have to be that something needs to be diminished for something else to right. benefit. It's not that black and white. Exactly. Yeah. However, using the term black and white, which is super appropriate, <laughs> there's a concept of African-American food and African food. Mm-hmm. But I think too much effort is being made to make them symbiotic. They're not. Right. They're not. They're, they're, they're cousins from the same parents, potentially, at some point. Yeah. But it's vastly different. Mm-hmm. You know, like, if the most... Strongest correlation, if I had to take just like collard greens braised with like ham hocks or like smoked jerky wings, yeah. and I take what I find to be the most direct correlation in West Africa, egusi soup, eforiro, it's like comparing like rice to like highly enriched plutonium. Yeah. Totally different. <laughs> highly enriched plutonium. That's great. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's just like so much more complex, so much more like prolific and interesting and uh-huh. delicious. Not to say like, you know, collard greens are not good, but they're just not like, you know. So in your mind, where's the where's the difference from just generations and generations of cooking with what's around you and coming onto a new continent? And, and the the difference is in complexity. I mean, certainly we can't. Again, it's not a negative conversation. The difference is in complexity because obviously African American food is based on what's available during the last vestiges of the slave trade and plantations. Right. It's based on access to what you have and being creative with what mm-hmm. you have. You know, it wasn't like, you know, people would say things like, you know, maybe like I started making fried green tomatoes because I thought the acidity was perfect for the crispiness. Right. No, they just gave all the slaves the green tomatoes. There's a reason like. for that, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know? So that's how those things, they come mm-hmm. out of necessity yes. and creativity yeah. and resourcefulness, mm-hmm. which are both brilliant things to have, but right. it's very different from African food, mm-hmm. you know, which is just has a kind of comfort of access, a comfort of various, you know, components. You know, as a chef, you understand this, you know, like food in the Western context from all cultures has to be sanitized is not a good word, but like has to be made to fit into a box that more people can appreciate it. Mm-hmm. But that box eliminates almost every time, what makes it special. You know, if you take Thai food, people make Pad Thai, it's just like sugar. Right. It doesn't have tamarind. Uh-huh. It doesn't have fish sauce. Yeah. No heat. funk. It doesn't have the heat, right? Yes, no, no acid. Funk. Yes, right, right. It's just like a bowl of stupid noodles from uh-huh. like Pei Wei, you right. know? Yes. <laughs> and some you know? and with fr- West frozen, frozen cubed vegetables. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. with West African food, if you remove like all of the fermented products, you know, 
you know, as a former Noma alumna, you mm-hmm. understand what the role that aminos and fermentation Correct. play. Yes. No dried shrimp, no uh, fermented locust beans. You know, the difference between Blake here and the Jazz Messengers, 42 people playing jazz, and the Miles Davis string quartet. I mean, Miles Davis like quartet, yes. you know, like, you know, Miles Herbie Hancock, you know, Tony Williams on Carter. Mm-hmm. It's about well, good music, right. either way. But one is more interesting than the other. Well, it's complexity level. Exactly. Too, right? yeah. I mean, and actually, that's actually a terrible analogy because both are actually very complex. Yeah, right. <laughs> the more appropriate conversation is the difference between like a chamber quartet, mm-hmm. like five violins, yes, and maybe one, four, three violins, one cello, and like the full like the Berlin Philharmonic mm-hmm. is like going to be like much more complex music, even though it's the same music. Correct. Yeah. That's the difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So where where does your relationship with food begin? My relationship with food begins from being in boarding school for some for some part in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. I went to like a boarding school, like a boarding high school, not like a you know university. Yeah. So you you develop a sense of independence and self determination for food very easily. But prior to that, you know, like I grew up in a house with my mother and like three sisters. So tasks were assigned irrespective of gender. And also mm-hmm. I had a father who was like very highly accomplished in the world of science and math. So there was also a component of intellectual curiosity. Mm-hmm. So you kind of play in those two worlds. You're like, why does this taste like this? Why are we doing it this way? Why are we killing a fresh chicken? Why are we doing all these things? You were asking these questions. I was thinking these questions uh-huh. in my head. Yeah. And sometimes occasionally asked. At an early age? At an early age. Or, or, and the task teen, that I- Teenager or, you know, oh, yeah. Before that, before I was that, like 15 yeah. years old, okay. 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Before that, you know, um, just the task of doing it at home, you know, like whether like we went to the market and we all like went in different directions to buy certain things. Like I would buy the peppers and the onions. Mm-hmm. My sisters would go buy the spices. My mother's like buying meat and fish. We all meat, but that, you know, uh-huh. you don't have to worry about your children being kidnapped in Nigeria. Right. Like, right? <laughs> right. So <laughs> it's like, go get the food and uh-huh. bring it back. Here's your little Apple AirTag or your belt. You yeah, know? right. <laughs> <laughs> 25 right. years ago. Yeah. No. Uh, so... We became part of every part of the process. You know, we get home, you know, we, you know, clay, we add electricity and a little oyster blender, blend the peppers and the mushrooms. So I was making like sofrito at like nine years old. Wow. Like, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't like a sofrito per se, but like the basic structure mm-hmm. of like what's that and flavoring beans. And as I continued to cook, when I was a teenager, I had like this existential crisis of whether I wanted to be a chef or a pyromaniac. Because I discovered fire. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and fire. It was fun to cook because exactly. of the fire. Yeah. Fire is like, <laughs> Pie is like, wow, you know, uh-huh. it's like your kid in Tuscany, someone's giving you pizza with a forno lenya, you know, you're like, yeah. oh my goodness, yeah, this right. is so much better than right. an electric oven. <laughs> so in Nigeria, we have one prolific street food called suya. It's like grilled beef, on a, usually beef at that time, on a skewer with mm-hmm. this peanut rub. Now you can get chicken, goat, whatever. But suya is like a constant, it's like kebab of mm-hmm. West Africa. Delicious. So we love suya, we used to make suya, we used to buy suya all the time. And that relationship with fire is what really promoted the idea of taking food very seriously. Mm-hmm. You know, as you know, one of the most interesting West African dishes is jollof rice, which is cooked right. as a, like a sofrito base, the rice, different meats and things. Same structure as cooking in Valencia. You used to run a very yes. Spanish restaurant. Uh-huh. You understand like paella valenciana. You understand like right. socarat. Yes. We had something like that in mm-hmm. Nigeria that was called party jollof. So when you burn the bottom, the sokarat, the tadig, we call it party jollof. Because if you're at a party, everybody wants the crispy right, bottom. Yeah, right. Uh, the, yeah, <laughs> right. There's only so much. Exactly. So where does the influence from Nigeria come from then? For the, I mean, you mentioned sofrito a bunch of times. Is that a European influence in the cooking? No, there's, no, there's no real influence. Uh-huh. What I am saying is using Western correlations. Correct. Okay. You know. But where does the foundation of, of cooking in Nigeria come from? The foundation comes from the terroir. Yes. It's really kind of almost, I don't see something that I would consider a positive foreign influence in Nigerian cooking. So there wasn't like Vietnam where it's French influence and you get baguettes with Asian, you know, Vietnamese ingredients and they they have this, they have this French influence. There's no influence like that. I mean, the only thing that you would say that is like influence from like England in Nigeria is like a can of corned beef. Right. Other than that, Uh we don't make like bangers and mash. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So there's one, only one thing I think that's influenced by the English in Nigeria. Nigerians have Nigerian meat pies, which also, if you understand, the other place colonized by the British is Jamaica, uh-huh. beef patties. Beef patties. They're like the same. Right. 
It's the same same dough, same. The dough in Nigeria doesn't have that yellow color. Okay. It's a little bit more flakier. Mm-hmm. The meat filling is like more substantial. Yes. You know, like Jamaican meat beef patties are sometimes like a Tinder date. You just show up and there's like right. nothing. It's like an empanada. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's like, why no am I substance. Here? Exactly. <laughs> Nigerian meat pies, full to the gills. Okay. Like this is a meat dish, not a pastry dish. Great. If you want a pastry dish, order a croissant. Right. You know? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> this is like. Tasty meat uh-huh. pie. Great. But that's like a derivative of like the Cornish pasty, I mm-hmm. believe it's Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not pasties, pasties. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's the one thing. But the, the, food, the food of Nigeria, I've never seen proliferate from English food. Like if you take, for example, one of the most important places in the unfortunate British Empire is India. Mm-hmm. And... There's, I, I can't say, unless I'm wrong, I don't see anything Indian, British about Indian food. Correct. But then when you go to the UK, you have like butter chicken, yeah. which is like basically BS. Right. It's like it, English. Yeah, but it works exactly. vice versa. Yeah. Vice versa. Mm-hmm. And then there's like vindaloos with no vinegar in England, yeah. which is not really a vindaloo. There's no heat in right. it. Yeah, you there's know. no heat. Yeah. But in Nigeria, there's no real, the same. There's nothing. Mm-hmm. It's just like a, it's, it's a cultural and you know, uh, structural colonialism, mm. but I don't think it added much of anything to West African Nigerian culture. From right. my perspective, I okay. could be wrong, but I don't see any of that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you're you're a young teenager cooking with your mom, you get interested in fire, you get interested in cooking. What happens next? What happens next is, you know, so all of those trips to the UK every summer and like wandering around England eating like silly things that you thought were amazing at the time, like hamburgers that uh-huh. are not even from England, they're actually from America. Like, oh, let's go to McDonald's in London. Like, mm-hmm. Fish like, and yeah. chips. Fish and chips. Yeah. Fish and chips I love, because yeah. at least cod is like, it's like the, you know, tuna is chicken out of the sea, cod is like pig out of the sea, uh-huh. you know. So fish and chips was good, uh, but there wasn't much more kind of connection. You know, bacon, the English are like prolific with bacon. There's like nine kinds of bacon mm-hmm. in the grocery store, from streaky to lean to all of this right. stuff. The, the interesting composed English breakfast with the fish and the baked beans and yeah, all of this beans, stuff. Yeah. You know, fried tomato, it's, it was, it's good. Mm-hmm. You know, but what it allowed was that the UK is a nexus of so many British Commonwealth countries. So if you didn't, you didn't have to go to like Pakistan, right. India, right. Australia, Jamaica, that's like Notting Hill, East Kensington, uh-huh. right. blah, blah, blah. Right, so right, you right. become you know, sort of a connected to all of these it's, flavors. Would you say it's more of a melting pot than the United States? The UK? Yeah. Um, I would say that from a culinary perspective, the UK presents more authentic versions of its cultural immigrant population. Mm-hmm. In America, it is initially that way for a very brief period of time, but, you know, as in general, the indiscipline in the United States creates like an immediate fusion. So yes. people don't learn enough about like Korean food before they start making Korean tacos. Right. Yeah. And then they know nothing about Korea, yeah, yeah, sushi burritos. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think it was. I think I was talking to Rick. I think it was Rick Bayless, and, yeah. and I were chatting one time, and we were talking about the differences between. Um, Mexican food in, in New York and LA and yeah. Chicago mm-hmm. and, and Tex-Mex. And right. He had mentioned why Chicago is the best place for Mexican food. It's because Mexican people were traveled over and they landed, migrated and they landed in Chicago mm-hmm. as opposed to landing in LA where they yeah. started taking their family recipes and mm-hmm. adapting them to the American. Immediately, right. Where what we had here was we had a whole bunch of you know, Mexican immigrants from yeah. all different parts of Mexico wound right. up in all different sections of Chicago. Yeah. And they started opening restaurants and cooking their recipes the way they were taught yeah. from their yeah. Pueblas or whatever. Exactly. And he goes, we have a, a much diverse Mexican population that's cooking their food. So you can go get dishes from Oaxaca. You can go get dishes from the border. You can get exactly. dishes from Mexico City. Right. There's all kinds of variety as yeah. opposed to LA where it's kind of pigeonholed into Mm -hmm. one, you know, like Baja, uh, California, kind of California Mexican cuisine. I thought that was very interesting. That's great. But, you know, on the flip side, America presents a much more wider landscape of creativity because, you know, so if you look at the UK contiguously, it's just homogeneous. Same weather, same climate, Mm -hmm. same everything. There's some coast, it's all cold around. It's like... Limited of products. Yeah. Well, there's expansive product, but what it is is... The climate limits your creativity. Correct. So if you think of America in a sense, you take people from like a river delta, Vietnam, you stick them in a river delta, 
Louisiana. What are they're they looking around What are they going to do? Yeah. I mean, this looks like where we grew up. Uh-huh. A lot more alligators, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, we can grow all our stuff here uh-huh. and Correct. cook all our stuff. Mm-hmm. So when you go to New Orleans and you eat, like, you know, Vietnamese food in, like, around the Louisiana, it's amazing. It's yes. creative, you Correct. know. You know, when a, when a bad me meets a po' boy, you know, when a pho meets, like, a, an etouffee, something, yes. you know, you know. And, you know, what's that, what's that famous chef? He's an American guy, but... He's, I think he's what he may have some connections, with, but he opened a pho spot in Vietnam and it's called Mofo, you know, or Mofo. Oh, no you know? kidding, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like kind of a funny play on the American M O Mofo, you uh-huh. know, your Mofos, you know. But so it's but also the food's good. It's interesting mm-hmm. juxtaposition of food. The Portuguese in New England, you know. Uh, Same, yes, correct. You know, uh, what do you call Fall River, Massachusetts? Mm-hmm. You know, you go there and you like have all the original sausages, the chorizos with yes. like rice in them, mm-hmm. and all of this great food. Yeah. There's a lot of really great food if you know where to look for it in America. Correct. You know, Brighton Beach has like basically Russia, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so within every American city, if someone's uh, resourceful enough, like I live in Philly, I know where to go for Polish food in Port Richmond. I know where to go for all the Eastern European, mm-hmm. former Russian Republic foods, Georgia, yes. Russia proper, you know, uh, Uzbeki food in the Northeast. Yes. You know, there's obviously the Korean section. I just did a whole thing Vietnamese, theme yeah. Mm-hmm. With Levan on West Africa, there's Vietnamese down here, yes. there's Indian everywhere. You know, it's good. You know, right. we're, we're spoiled in this country. Yeah, this is the only country where you may not need to actually fly outside of the country to get like really great food. You know? What might be the problem with the United States? Which is the problem with <laughs> Which the is the problem States. with, yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have uh, um, growing up cooking. How did you start working in restaurants then? Well, so I went to college proper. And then uh, I was always fascinated with Coke and I started, it's actually funny. The, the first thing that made me then take food outside of my own cultural origin seriously was Marcella Hazan. Believe it or not. No kidding. I swear to God. Really? Yeah. I bought a Marcella Hazan book, I think at Heathrow Airport. Uh-huh. I took it home. I was reading it on the plane. I read it for like a year and a half. I was like fascinated because Marcella tells a great story. Uh-huh. There was no pancetta, prosciutto, no. Mm-hmm. or parmigiano, or anything in Nigeria. I yeah. wasn't making any of the food. Right. None. For you, two years. You were just reading. I just reading the book. Yes. I read the book as a story. Okay. And so eventually when I moved to the United States and I ended up in Philadelphia, I was like, well, oh, look. You have access a, to everything. It's an Italian yeah. market. Not mm-hmm. everything. But when I moved here, they, you couldn't even put prosciutto in America because they're like, it's not cooked. So uh-huh. I'm like, it's been salted for like two years. What right. are you talking about? So... <laughs> So I started actually cooking Italian food and simultaneously at the same time, my good friend, who I'm still friends with to me, Simone Sassoli, I met several years later, was from Tuscany and we started getting together and cooking and his parents would come and we would make food and I just, I just adopted Italy as almost like a sister country, even though I was in the United States. Italian food became like sort of like my barometer of like wanting to cook. And as I took that cooking seriously, I decided in the middle of all my things to sort of like, you know, set aside my continuation of a mainstream college education to devote more time to cook. I went to, at the time, Du Chaminet, which was around the corner here. It was a, Philadelphia at the time had like three French restaurants, Du Chaminet, Le Bec Fan, mm-hmm. and the Fountain at the Four Seasons. Yes. Jean-Marie Lacroix was a great chef. Fritz Blanc at Du Chaminet. Le Bec was like, War. The pinnacle. Uh, du Chaminet was like being in the south of France uh-huh. and still making great food in the country house. Um, Four Seasons was like a corporation, you know, yeah. but led by a very brilliant chef. Right, right, right. So I went to Du Chaminet first. I went there to do like a stage. I got hired the next day. They're like, you're really good. Do you need a job? I'm like, yeah, when can I start? Tonight. Great, done. You know, and then I worked with Fritz for two years. And at some point, Fritz was... It was an amazing place to work, first of all, because Fritz was friends with so many people who would always come. There were always two people who came in for lunch every day, and there like, was one person dedicated to staff lunch. But the people who were coming to lunch were like the major celebrities mm-hmm. of food and food literature in the world. Yeah. You know, I met Jessica Harris in like... This was, the eight, this was the 80s now? or No, this is like the late 90s, okay. almost 2000. Mm-hmm. I met Jessica Harris like 20 years no, ago. No kidding. Before like high on the hog. Yeah. Pierre Frenet, 
uh, Marianne Esposito. I was mm-hmm. like a young Padawan. I was yeah. like not even like a Jedi anyway. Yeah. I could not even see like the exhaust of a starship, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <It's Sorry. crazy. laughs> so so well, meanwhile, I'm in all this crazy Fred Ferretti, you know, uh, Eileen Yefelo, you know, the you know, editor of like the New York Times, yeah. you know, food section, you know. And but Fritz was also Eastern European. He was a molecular biologist who graduated from Penn, so he was able to lean in with a lot of the science of what he did. I really, at Duchamp now, I would make all this interesting German, Eastern European food for like staff meal. So I was just like learning flavor from other cultures. Mm-hmm. And at some point he was just like, son, it's time for you to move on to the lion's den. I'm like, where's that? Submarine base somewhere in Germany? No, he's like, Lebeck Finn. Lebeck Finn. So I called George. Let's put a pause on that for one second. Yeah. I want to go back to you cooking Italian food when you first got here. Yeah. Um, what similarities did you find from cooking in Nigeria to cooking Italian food? Were there any were there techniques or, or anything that spoke to you from, oh, this is very similar to what we're doing, yes. what I was doing at home? Like, there was. Let's talk about that for a second. There was. And that's all about Marcella Hazan because she was very, she was like an OCD. I never met her. I wish I did. Yeah. That's like probably my greatest regret. In like, I wanted to meet two people when I came to America, Miles Davis and Marcella Hazan, yeah. and Winton Marsalis. I met two of them. I did not meet Marcella, but I met Miles, Miles uh, Davis in, in uh, New York, no Village kidding. Vanguard, and I met Winton Marsalis in Philadelphia, oh, playing in the cool, church. Man. So, um, but Marcella told a very specific story of like why you should do certain things, but she also referenced in, in like how to screw it up, because she was, I think, the most important. Italian food advocate in America. And if you read her books, you know. Yeah, of course, like, yes. Yeah, amazing you know, books. On the in the in the Bolognese section. Yeah. Like Americans use too much sauce. Mm-hmm. You know, this is like enough sauce to use for the pasta. Yeah. You know, you want to make carbonara, like don't use bacon. What's wrong with you? Right. Buy pancetta. Uh-huh. I know you can't find guantelli, but you can find pancetta. Right. Take your ass to like, you know, I don't know, Zagara's or somewhere and yeah. buy it. So the reinforcement of quality standards, no compromises, finding the right ingredient, understanding the caramelization mm-hmm. method, deglazing, yes. uh, all of those methods, what is al dente, which is a broad lesson in texture yes. for anything, vegetable, meat, fish. Mm-hmm. Really was a good training that made me really reference. Again, remember I have like a, a father who is like kind of also at the same time that I have this exposure to culinary art and creativity. I have a very purely scientific like yes. influence. I'm doing like Academic, calculus and yes, algebra right. mm-hmm. at the same time right, and right. physics and chemistry. And I'm thinking, okay, so this is how. So probably the luckiest part of my childhood is being able to tie all those concepts together mm-hmm. into a way that allowed me to see that even though there were no ingredient correlations between Nigerian food and in Italian food, there was an important correlation in process and technique. Yes. And that's what made it important. That's okay. what made it good. Great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's get to Lebeck Finn now. So you, you called George. So I called, I, well, so Fritz did. Yeah. George obviously didn't talk to me. Yeah. He said, mm-hmm. you know, tell him to go talk to Peter Gilmore, <laughs> right, right. who was the CDC. So uh-huh. I show up at Lebeck like at 7 a.m. one day and I told Peter, hey, Peter, I'm here in stage. Blah, 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 blah. I used to be at Duchamonet. It's like, all right, well, you can start today. And so I started doing prep work. And you know, I cooked fairly advanced for a person walking out of, into a restaurant of that caliber. So I understood a lot of the concepts. I had read a lot about mm-hmm. it, so, you know. You were familiar with the brigade system. You're familiar with how the kitchen yeah. worked. And yeah, I was on the lowest part of it. So I like was the last one. I wasn't being messed with from both sides. Yeah, it, the middle of the brigade, I think is worse than like the top <laughs> yeah, or the bottom. Right. You want to be the I top agree. or the yeah. bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're the fish cook. Like, uh-huh. The entrementier is like asking, wait, like when you need your veg, the mm-hmm. chefs are like, dude, put it on the pass. Right, right. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody Fs with the chef or like the guy making the mirror pie. Yeah, yeah. So I was the guy making the mirror pie in like five gallon buckets. And then I, uh, you know, I was, but the one thing about, I was also like a very precise person. So my part of the restaurant was, I think, I wouldn't say the most important, but it's one of the most consequential. If you know anything about Georges Perry, it's like, and if you see, if you look at the French language cookbook, there's a forward by Thomas Keller talking about like sauces and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think most people who lived in Lebec then understood that the completely bonkers process of making our sauces yeah. might have been the best in the world yeah. that I have ever seen. 
I mean, we had guest chefs come in and make sauces. I'm like, what are you kidding? Is that a sauce? Yeah. I'm not going to name names. Right, right. But I, I spent a good amount of time with John Bunche. <laughs> just the same. It's like, exactly. Jesus so John Bunche used yeah. to come to Lebec. Yes. My first pâté de campagne. Uh-huh. I was like making pâté de campagne at Lebec. One of these pâté. And John Bunche is there smoking cigars. Yeah, yeah. Door. She's like, yo, come here. I show you how to mix this. You know? Uh-huh. So yeah. like we're grinding meat, we're packing it. It's like Georgia yeah. the Cure. It's amazing. You know, George, John Benche is one of my, my, my favorite, uh, my favorite experiences at Lebec. Yeah, you know? we would be in the kitchen and the phone would ring and you know, this is back yeah. when we had phones. <laughs> And answer the phone and be like, hey, you know, the kitchen at La Francaise, yeah. let me talk to Jean. And it's always <laughs> like they would call each other at like two o'clock. Oh every, let God. me talk to Jean. You know? It's the same here. It's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jean Banche is here. Uh-huh. So the best day times at Lebec is actually when Jean Banche came to visit George in person because yeah. that was the most relaxed George was. And we just get our work yeah, yeah, that yeah. Drama, and These two guys like, and they were all teaching us stuff that <laughs> uh-huh. that's not even on the menu. Yeah, yeah. So that was incredible. And, you know, so Lebec became like, this place of just like reverence and what you could do when there was no compromise. Now at this time in the United States, there was only how many French restaurants? No, there were several. I mean, like it just, there was just a, like, you know, so this is at the time of Le Fancy, the original yes. Le Bernardin with uh, yes. Guy Lacoste. Mm-hmm. Correct, Latouse. Ba- I'm sure Lutece was yes. in New York, Le Coque Basque. Le Coque Basque, yeah. Uh, uh, what was super French there? Uh, Jean-Louis Paladin was in Louis DC. Jean-Louis Paladin at DC, yeah, right, um, right. You know, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of, but there was like and then so there was many. Wolf, then there was Wolfgang on, on the West Coast. Wolfgang on the West mm-hmm. Coast, yeah. you know, and. Chez Panisse. Yeah, Chez yeah. Panisse mm-hmm. was there. There yeah. were all this like really, you know, um, but then like there was also the secondary derivative ones that came after that, Lespinas, you know, with, with yeah. uh, Grey Coons. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the French laundry was the original was French laundry well was after. Napa, yeah, right, right. But that was well but after. Back in those times, and you know, there was those restaurants were unstoppable. Yeah, you know, they were. George Perry, right, you know, all yeah. those places we spent were like yeah. that. That was that was it. That's where the Thomas yeah. Kellers wanted to work. That's exactly. where they did work. That's exactly. where they cut their teeth. That, you know, look at the lineage of uh, Chez Panisse chefs that comes right. here. It's like it's like a a, a VIP baseball trading card list, absolutely you know? yeah i mean you know yeah. the line the line cooks at like bless penas were like rocco dispirito mm-hmm. andrew camellini yes, yes correct like, that's just like mm-hmm. a crazy list of like right. people like that you know like wait what this right. is like the baseball all-star game yeah yeah so so you're cutting vegetables you're cutting so, but so the, inter- the 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 sauce industrial complex is what we call it at Lebec. It was amazing, <laughs> that's incredible. Great, that's like, say that again. The it's sauce, called, industri- the sauce industrial complex. <laughs> that's fucking great. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. First of all, they'll get like a stage. Like I was like a a stage that had a stash. Yeah. Like it's that uh-huh. crazy. Get a stage below me before I became full time. Five gallon buckets every day by. 5 p.m. before, so that, mm-hmm. so that, so this is, this is what happens. So we show up, Sam Sheridan shows up at 7 a.m. with me, comes down. I help him start to get the sauces. Three long 36 inch flat tops, right? Whole thing. Big ass Moville pots. Mm-hmm. We have all, everything ready. Bucket, celery, carrot, onion, garlic, bay leaf, pre-tied bouquet garnies. Yes. Or bay leaf thyme. Yes. Or one of thyme only. Um, Stocks, chicken, jus de poulet, yes. beef, yes. veal, uh, lobster, mussel, uh, clam, yeah. uh, uh, nage, which is just like a vegetable mm-hmm. broth that we made, yeah. uh, venison, one, whatever. venison yeah. mm-hmm. quail, quail. Uh, bones, all the bones of the above animals, yes. roasted, also ready in buckets. Right. Uh, plus chi- plus veal, veal, veal feet, uh, chicken veal feet, feet for gelatin. Chicken feet, yeah. all the stuff. Mm-hmm. All set up. There's like 30 buckets in front of you. Holy like 12 fuck, pots, yeah. Yeah. like on the thing. Yeah. You don't want to. You're putting oil in everything. You don't uh-huh. want to put. Maybe a pot. It's crazy. Yeah. All the bones, shh, the glazing, different mm-hmm. things. It's like you're uh, like a I don't know some kind of crazy like blue man group concert. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're just like doing all this stuff. You're deglazing, everything's coming to simmer, you're yeah. adding the stocks, you're letting it come to a boil, you're mm-hmm. turning it to a simmer, which yes. is not exactly easy on a flat top that's uh-huh. like ripping hot and you have to bring it down. Yeah. And then they basically simmer for like four hours, yeah. four to six hours for the meat sauces, the brown meat sauces. Mm-hmm. And then once that's going, separate other little stove, you do the fish sauce. We make the fish sauces every day. We build the meat sauces with the mm-hmm. leftover sauce from the day before. Yes. So the fish sauces are like 
Bro Blanc, mm-hmm. Bro Nash, yes. Bro Rouge. The like drippings from, the, from, the, from the cooking liquids. Exactly. Yes. All of the creamy mm-hmm. fish sauces, yep. Bro Leger for yep. mushroom. Right, right. All of, so there's like nine other like Vin light Blanc, sauces, yeah. mm-hmm. Vin Blanc, yes. all this stuff. And all that's going. Once all that's going, you're like working with someone else to make all the emulsions, the cold ones, yes. Gribbish, mayonnaise, curry sauce, yeah. lemongrass sauce, uh-huh. all of this. And then, so the pa- and then the passing begins. <laughs> oh my God. And then you have to like... And then the passing pass. starts. Before yeah. the passing though, right. like... One thing that nobody does anymore today that makes the sauces at Lebec Fent ever yeah. the best. It really breaks my heart because I don't know who it is that created the concept of the veil stock reduction. I think it might have been Charlie Trotter. Mm-hmm. You know, where you just, you, there was this concerted effort to make lighter sauces. I'm like, why? You don't need lighter sauce. Right. You know, it's like buying a Ferrari. I'm like, we should drive slower. Yeah. <laughs> what, are what are you doing? You know? So. <laughs> They wanted to take away the richness of sauces to make them good enough but lighter. As you clearly know, that's not possible. Right. So what we did at the back was like we did the traditional liaison method. We had like, like literally maybe like a half, half of a five gallon bucket of burmani. Yeah. You know, remember, mm-hmm. it's equal amounts of flour and butter yes. just mixed with together. Well, the difference with that is a roux as you cook it, you roux, burmani yeah. is yeah. just burmani right. is mm-hmm. just raw. Right. So we take like a little, we take like some of the sauce out of the, all of the meat sauces, mm-hmm. put in the vein, make a like slurry. Two tablespoons yeah. of burmani, burn it with a stick blender, yeah, yeah. pour it all back in, whisk it, mm-hmm. totally, no xanthan gum, yeah. works beautifully, cook it for 10 minutes, it glazes and glosses, pass it through a chinois, ice, skim the fat, ready. You know, mm-hmm. send it upstairs for dinner. Yeah. Whatever's left we use for lunch, we do the same thing every day. Mm-hmm. Seven days a week. Crazy. Right. You know. And it was just beautiful and delicious and good. Yeah. You know, it, it's amazing. What Banche used to do to us was yeah. we would show up early because we wanted to learn how to make the sauces. Same say everything you just said was yeah. the same exact process, right. you know. So we would get there, he was already there. He tells mm-hmm. us to come at, at eight, he was there at six. Yeah. <laughs> so we'd show up, everything's sort of kind of working, everything's laid out, and we'd be like, okay, you got your notebook, okay, chef, where are we at? Ah, uh, okay, Rion, we couldn't say Ryan, so we're, uh, run downstairs to the basement and grab me uh, a whole list of things that weren't even down there. Yeah. And I'd spend 20 minutes, and I'd come up with like a couple onions and be like, chef, I couldn't find anything. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. And all the sauces were already out. <laughs> And it's like, okay, in an hour, you're going to strain all these. And yeah. it's like, that's strain. It. But yeah. the thing that he did, which I think he might be the only one, is during the roasting of the bones process, he would take powdered stock, mm-hmm. like powdered chicken stock, or yeah. powder, and he would sprinkle a little bit of that and yeah. that, that umami, yeah. that uh, the MSG that was in there, whatever, the salt that was yeah. in there, just like, mm-hmm. it was like like a shot of like steroids yeah. to, to, to the sauces. Absolutely. and. um it was ama- he was an amazing sauce guy, you know? You know, a lot of people today, it's, that's a controversial subject to bring up because a lot of people today think like using atomized or freeze-dried stocks, which mm-hmm. include some enhanced glutamate. Yes. It's cheating. I mean, you could do it like that. Everything in Japan is of enhanced glutamate. Correct. And there's no cuisine more revered by chefs uh-huh. than Japanese food. You can smell it. You're like, like oh. Noma right? is literally moving to Kyoto to cook food. Yes. Like, it's like, and everybody bought tickets for like $4 uh-huh. million dollars in like right, two right. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. Correct. Is something wrong with that? No, yeah. it's because it's good, mm-hmm. you know. But if you look at the big anthology of Alain Ducasse, it says clearly in the chicken broth, chicken stock uh-huh. recipe, six chickens and some chicken powder stock yes. or bullion cubes. Yes. And you know what? It actually works. It's, it's delicious. delicious. It's, it's delicious. really good. Yeah. You know, the best Western chicken broth that's in a famous restaurant that I think I've ever had and I think that most people are aware of was the chicken broth that was made at Joel Robuchon. Of course, man. Yeah. And it's because they use like six whole organic chickens. They remove all the skin. Yeah. They tie it up. Mirepoix whole. They bring it to a boil, simmer for three hours. There's a bunch of chicken powder in it. Mm-hmm. And it's good it's and great. it's clear it's and delicious. it's golden uh-huh. and it's amazing. Yeah. You know, your grandmother will obsess about her matzo broth and probably <laughs> slit her wrist because she's not able to get this flavor. Uh-huh. But the secret is chicken broth powder. Right, right. And good chickens. Old so, hens. Old hens. That's K-pons. where it's at. Uh-huh. Yeah. K-pons, yeah. yeah. Um, so how long were you at Lebec Finn then? I was there for two years first. And then I took some time off to involve myself in cycling. Mm-hmm. I worked at Lebec five days a week. I had the weekends off and I was also working part-time at a bike shop. Mm-hmm. Like as I was a salesperson, assistant manager, and I was a pretty interested cyclist. Yeah. You know, didn't really race per se, but like rode with a lot of 
super serious cyclist. So it was like my hobby. I wasn't at that point with the direction of fully committing myself to food as a full-time thing because there was still some limited upward mobility and income in cooking, no matter if you were cooking at the best restaurant in the country. So you were working at Lebeck Finn, considered yeah. one of the best restaurants in the country at the time, and you're yeah. like, I don't know if I want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is the best place I can do, my, I can exercise my interest in food. Mm -hmm. I was like butchering squabs, I was like shaving truffles, yeah. I was cooking some of the best fish in the world, Lou de Mer from the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, all this crazy stuff. Spiny yeah. lobster from Brittany, Scottish langoustines. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I can't afford any of this stuff. You know, I ate that because I walked there. Right. Give right. me a free lunch. <laughs> you know, they used such a thing as a free lunch. So it was fantastic. But, um, and then I sort of got seduced into the whole world of like European stages. Mm -hmm. And I went to do a short stage at the Fat Duck, which I didn't really love. When was this? This was in 05-ish. Okay. I went to do a short stage at Fat Duck, which, you know, I don't take anything from the restaurant. I think I had the wrong impression of what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I discovered in the process that I was not a fan of what I think at the time was classified as molecular gastronomy, mm -hmm. you know, and I, it just didn't speak. After coming from such a rigid Jean Benchet, Jeff Perry world, yes, making like you know, I don't know, what, what were their favorite thing? Fish covered in licorice and yes. like some of uh -huh. this soup that's hot and cold. Yep, is not was not really my right thing. You know, I wanted to cook delicious, awesome food, so I would like go like on my day up to like the water side and just like eat like a really good mm -hmm. dinner. Or, like, yeah. Like Le Manoir, Le Manoir, Court Saison. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'm like, right, this right, is right. I should have come right. to work, you know. Gee whiz, Michael Pierre White, Gordon Ramsay. Mm -hmm. I love that food, you know. Yeah, right, That's right. good stuff. So I came back how did, to... How did you get interested in that, though? Just from what was going on in, in, the, in the industry? Uh, it was kind of like trendy. or like the Fat Duck seems to be doing cool stuff. E-Gullet. E-Gullet? Well, E-Gullet. e, -gullet. e, -gullet. e -gullet was active there. I became friends with all these people on E-Gullet. Uh -huh. It was the the big game changer. Egolet is how I met John Scanzo. Yes. It's how I met uh, Scott Manlin. Right. It's how I met all of these chefs who were contributing. Egolet started even before it was open. The Alinea project, yes. where Nick Coconas and Grant mm -hmm. were talking about what they were going to do. They yeah. brought it to life. Before that, I was kind of aware of like all of this for some weird reason. Chicago became kind of like that. Next, you know, that was great. Uh, Elliot Bowles was there like on. Hamaro Cantu, Elliot Bowles, Schwa, Stephanie Schwa, Izzard was exactly. coming up at the time. I had a restaurant no. butter at the time. Who was Avenues? Avenues, yeah, it was uh, Graham Elliot. Graham yep. Elliot, mm -hmm. uh, Curtis Duffy was Curtis, doing something. Not, yeah, Curtis Duffy was still with, uh, with, with, with Trio. Yeah, he was at Trio yeah. and yeah. Um, at Trio, you know. But uh, that was, that was it at, at that time, 2005 yeah. Chicago, that was it, man. Chicago it was, was uh, the nexus of Kirk. non- French laundry of, cooking, non California. Yes, of creativity. David Chang figs right. on a plate cooking. We had Alex Alex Talbot was here and we were talking about it. Yeah. We talked immensely about e yeah. and the, and yeah. the um, influence that yeah. it had. And The other Alex Stupak Alex was still, Stupak a, was was a, still a pastry chef there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wiley was doing mm -hmm. his thing in New York City, which yeah. was very popular, yeah. you know, and so that became like a. So, and it was like everyone talking about like, oh, I'm going to stage at like Mogaritz or I'm going yes. to like, you know, uh, sell at Cam Roca mm -hmm. or, you know, El Bulli, you know. So I became friends with all these people who had gone in different directions in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Lieberns, you yes. know, mm -hmm. like a landscape of rebels, you know. But so that made, that's what created the whole structure of one to be curious about uh, European cooking and as Spanish avant-garde cooking became like sort of like the new focus of like American chefs uh, it was very easy for everybody to either go to Spain or or for me as someone who didn't speak Spanish and wasn't really necessarily in a short-term language barrier it was easier for me to go to somewhere in the UK and for that the other yeah. place was Fat Dog well it was it was it was easier to go to Spain because they were more accepting. They were more accepting. You were sent, I sent my resume to all yeah. these French chefs and nobody messed nobody me back. Was, exactly. And I sent it to five Spanish chefs. Like, come whenever yeah. you want, man. We got a place for you to stay. Exactly. You know. So it, it, that, I think that was a huge tectonic shift yeah. in the restaurant industry of like Spain coming into their own. Right. The, 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 the tourist board was behind some of these restaurants. Yeah. They were really pumping it up. And yeah. the Spanish chefs were like, come yeah. here's, here's my notebook. Yeah. Take all the notes you want. Yeah. Let me know what you want to see. Exactly. Yeah. And so the Spanish were able to like, you know, a bit of subterfuge take over like the the pinnacle of what's considered like gastronomy from the French surreptitiously, but because they had an open source architecture, they did it smartly, and they became really 
the you know the kind of like bar they set mm-hmm. the bar for what would be the future of avant garde cooking right so i participated in that a little bit and i took what i could from it but i never really forgot the roots of what i consider foundational flavor based cooking that was more or less about technique but more about like results and you know you know it's in a way like it's like doing like algebra versus calculus mm-hmm. you know they're very different things but they require a similar mental approach to correct execute and get to the answers you know and then at that point you know coming back from fat dog it was when i started to have this you know i went to lebec again to do a little bit more of a stint because there was necessary work and then i left that to go work for steven star who i met by pure coincidence and steven was opening a restaurant that was a french bistro that was basically based on the idea of the American bishop, which was at that time Balthazar Pastis. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I went to Balthazar with Steven and his team, ate all the food, decided, hey, can you cook this food? I'm like, Steven, this is like a thousand times easier than what we're doing yeah. in the back. <laughs> like, jus de poulet and like yeah. steak sauce, done. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I yeah. was making like 22 other sauces mm-hmm. besides this. And like, it was like stuff like bandad and like, you know, steak free. Yeah. It was easy, but still, it's able to bring enough of a precision to it that it was really, really tasty. And Steven really appreciated that. You know, a lot of people like look at the star restaurant and like, well, Steven's not a chef, it's just a restaurant, he doesn't really care about food. Nothing could be visionary. further from the truth. It's a visionary. It's a visionary, he will care about the truth. Yeah. About the food. So, I mean, I remember days when I was like, you know, I worked at Blue, it was called Blue Angel. I worked at Blue Angel from mm-hmm. like Tuesday through Saturday and then I had Sunday, Monday off. Yeah. So on Saturday night, after service, because we had enough cooks, you know, by 7 p.m. I was like off, out of the process, yeah. even though I stayed till like 1 a.m. But from like 8 p.m. to like 2 a.m., I would basically be doing what I would do from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. at La Yeah, I would go down to Dance's Kitchen and make all of the sauces, enough to actually get them through the weekend, Saturday mm-hmm. and Sunday. And like make sure all the vinaigrettes tasted the same, labeled everything, cooled it down before I left, which is why I left at 1 a.m. And then (laughs) I was gone for two days. So like you cannot possibly run out of everything. Totally, yeah. But they knew how to make them. So Mm -hmm. that saved them a lot of time. And many of those times, you know, it would be like 12.30 or 1. Sometimes I'd stay till like 2.30 where everyone totally going except me and maybe one other person. And still would just like, I hear the alarm open in the front door. And like still would be like, hey, what are you guys doing? How many restaurants did he have at this time? Three. Yeah, so he Budokan, was still Tangerine, Budokan, Blue Angel. Budokan. Yeah, that was it. So oh, he was, Continental. Four. Continental, that's yeah. right, yeah. So, but he was actively involved in the day-to-day in some of these places. You'd well, see him more ha- often. He didn't yeah. have to be. But he I was mean, there. he had a management team. Bradley was there. Mm-hmm. Michael Palermo was there. Yeah, Michael Palermo. But he yeah. was there all the time. He yeah. came in. There's no day I was at Blue Angel that Stephen did not pass through the building at yeah, some yeah, point, yeah. at least once uh-huh. during the day. Or like send some of his like, you know, surreptitious tasters to come and try something. Right. It's like someone's telling me, like, the problem is has too much acid. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Steven, it's a lemon sauce. <laughs> it's like, are you sure? I'm like, yes, okay. Right. <laughs> what, were some, what were some of the things that you learned from Steven himself about operating a business, owning restaurants, any li- life lessons? Uh, that, you know, food's not enough. Emotion is important. Yes. Emotion and is important. And experience. experience is important. Yes. yes. And experience starts with food and flavor and everything. But... The emotion of the totality of the experience is yeah. important. Yeah. I, I feel like he weighs the, the, the experience more than the food. When you walk into a Steven Star restaurant, you're, you're taken by, you know, the grandioso of it. You're taken by the, the length of the details of the menu. Like he, he really looks at every element of the restaurant to try to create an experience that's going to transfer you from here to France. It's going to transfer you from here to Southeast Asia. Would you say that that's a, a good comparison? Uh, I would probably, I mean, I agree and disagree in the sense that in my experience with Steven, so for example, like, this is what the importance of delegation is. You may have your vision of what you're trying to present to the public, but you also have to be intelligent enough to hire the people to execute it. Correct. So Steven hired someone like me because he tasted my food and was like, I know those sauces are going to be, like, I don't have to make them. I don't really, maybe not give a sh- crap about like how you're making them, mm-hmm. but I know they're very good because there's something built into your head mentally that comes from George Perry that makes them what they are. Yeah. And as my contribution to that, I'm going to spend like an extra $80,000 to make sure the tiles from the back of the kitchen to the front of the restaurant look like you're in France. Uh-huh. And like, we have like 225 light fixtures in like a four by four grid. Yes. When I could just have like 20 light fixtures. Right, right. You know, because I want you to feel the emotion. Mm-hmm. 
So even though he may not have been intellectually or emotionally connected with the details of the cooking, I think he appreciated the flavors that our efforts were able to uh, execute mm -hmm. and give us the stage to actually allow our food to generate stronger emotion right. from the people That's eating great. it. If we just had a room that was drywall like this and like had lights and we dimmed the lights yeah, and we served uh -huh, you right. bistro food, you're like, right. what the hell is this? Totally. It's like, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's good, but it's not trans. It's, it's not. not it's not. Yeah. It's not uh, invoking no. any memories. Exactly. Yes. So yeah, yeah. that's what I think I appreciated about Stephen as a as a restaurant, mm -hmm. and that would I, attach to all his restaurants. Ahmed Kuba felt like he went Havana. Uh, Moimoto felt yes. like he went like quasi modern uh, Japan. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, An anime Japan. You know, yeah. Exactly. Right. So yeah. All of those places just did something. Yeah. For, How long did you stay with Stephen for? Only for a year. And a half, I believe. Mm -hmm. However, my, my separation from the Star Wrestling Group was more of a personal decision to start to really think about the idea of what my connection to food was, which is when I decided like the whole pop-up consulting world, Studio Kitchen. Studio Kitchen, yeah. Became like my focus to just see where I could go. It was partly inspired by E. Gollett and the, you know, freedom. You know, there's that movie. Who is it? Is it like Spicoli from Fast Times? Or like the guy from like... Uh, you know, uh, risky business who like freedom brings opportunity. You know? Oh, it's a uh, fast time around high. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so I was like, freedom brings opportunity. You know, what can you do when you're free, when you're not went to a restaurant? And that's what Studio Kitchen became. It's like, mm -hmm. let's play with food, let's play with the ideas. That's when I really started the idea of like partnering with like manufacturers and like talking about like, okay, so I'm doing, and I wrote like honest like nice letters to people. I'm like, hey, listen, like this is my shoulder. I am a nobody. I don't even have a pot to like pee in, but <laughs> I'm doing this thing. I think it's cool. What can you get me that I can play around with? Can I pay you for it in a couple of months? Yeah, right, right. And I wrote like Philip Preston's people in Chicago mm -hmm. and Paulo Science, like, Paulo yes. Science is great, yeah. Like I had like sous vide circulators, like all the same things that like Alinea was like doing mm -hmm. at the same time. As right. soon as like Grant's anti griddle was made, boom, got one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but where did the idea for Studio Kitchen come from? So you're, you've been a chef, you're working at restaurants, you worked at some of the best restaurants in Philly and around Philly, you worked for Steven Starr, and now you're like, you know what, I'm gonna. I traveled the world, I had been in different situations, I had been with people in other interdisciplinary professions, mm -hmm. you know, artists, academicians, architects, my sister was one other things and you know so for me the concept of an atelier was like what it is what is your workshop yes and at the same time i was friends with alex talbot atelier translates to a workspace workspace exactly. uh, i think it, it, yeah. the direct translation in, in 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 spain i think is like garage is what yeah. it would translate yeah. to but um, like you a know. working working space and so. they say taller yeah yeah, the yeah. Taller. it's like your May go to the taller. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a kitchen that costs 150 grand. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> so I decided that that would be a great place to find of expand on creativity, intellectual curiosity, but also find a way to amortize it, though surreptitiously with pop-ups and all of these things. So that's how Studio Kitchen came. And Studio Kitchen continued to evolve to be into what it is today, which is like a lot of structured relationship with manufacturers of some of the most prolific, important technological concepts in cooking. You yes. know, Rational, EG, Pack with Jet, all of those things, mm -hmm. and Irinox. And so you develop a brain trust of like cooking technology, but also with a background of classic cooking skill that right. allows people today, allows you to be a liaison today for chefs who would like to figure out like best practices and efficiencies to still allow them to do what they do, which mm -hmm. is intrinsically cooked in a tactile way, but also not waste their time doing things in ways that are not necessary. Right, right. So how do you how do you feel like working at the restaurants that you did set you up for what you're doing now? It's like, you know, everything, the totality of the experience is is some of all your experiences. You know, you, you remember the best things that you learn and, you know, take note of the worst things that you don't want to be a part of. Right. The worst things tend to be more on the human relationship side. Yeah, always. Which would be like somebody not really having the talent or the ability to do something mm -hmm. or the, the more odious ones, which is improper behavior in several categories yes. or even yes. not maybe so improper, but brinksmanship. And because I remember some restaurants where there were like really, really talented people 
But it was like everybody was trying to be like the, you know, the smartest person mm-hmm. in the room. Yeah, it's too cutthroat. And and teamwork is, teamwork is kind of ultimately the most important thing. You know, if there's something I regret about my cooking career, at one point I strongly considered, but I didn't want to do it because I just was didn't have the confidence and I just did not think I would survive the weather. Mm-hmm. I wanted to move to Chicago and work for Charlie Trotter. Amazing but I just legend. didn't do it. You just didn't do it. I just didn't do it. Yeah. You know, I didn't have the confidence. And then when I now look back at like the people who were there at the time, like John Shields uh-huh. and like, you know, Guillermo Teles yeah, and like yeah, yeah. all of this other like. Why, why Trotter? Because Trotter was the person who made the strongest case of, and maybe he didn't, but his books which came up in rapid fire succession, Charlie Trotter, Charlie Trotter's fish, Charlie Trotter's vegetables. I mean, his books changed the industry. Exactly. Yeah. And his books were like, kind of almost like a quick anthology of how to take everything you know. And a lot of chefs didn't have any broad ideas of other cultures. Yes. But I think I did because I traveled a lot as a kid and lived in countries that had diverse communities. His books was, were the first to put in an American context very accurately how you can use fusion, without using the word fusion, to create interesting cuisine based on the ingredients of other cultures. Mm-hmm. Like, there was nobody cooking hamachi right. in any restaurant that was not Japanese. Right, right. Let alone with morels and, mm-hmm. like, sweetbreads. Mm-hmm. Things like that. So you started to get this really crazy, expanded use. And then just all the other, you know, new things that you never saw. Hearts of Palm, you know, like... Uh-huh. Yeah, hearts of Palm. Exactly. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. all this other, like, interesting... You know, yeah. sea beans. Like, you're like, wait. Yeah, yeah. It's like, first of all, I buy this book. I need to get a dictionary of like what is all these ingredients yeah. in them. So I thought that that would be a place to learn. And then, like, you know, Charlie was very involved in like the sort of like use of like sous vide at the time, even though it wasn't like broadly used. Mm-hmm. And you know, looking at that, like I worked for George. He was pretty disciplined and very organized. But like, you know, looking at like pictures of Charlie Schroeder with like kitchen cabinets that were like stainless steel and yes. glass, you know, I'm like, uh-huh. geez, you know, there can't be any fingerprints in right, this goddamn right, right. place, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it's like, a level of excellence we haven't seen before. A level of excellence mm-hmm. we hadn't seen before. He insisted that people wear toques, which is fine with me, uh-huh. you know, like, yeah. but I saw that what they were doing was very precise. And, mm-hmm. and, and there was a time where uh, my good friend who has since passed away, Helen London, was the owner of the really important Western supply store, Previn, in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And Previn was, Previn's customer number one was Charlie Trotter. Really? They shipped everything to Chicago. Helen was the first person to really actually bring containers of things from France, like Macfair, Dubuyer, yeah. Bougia, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of that Those really. things were so hard to get they back were then, so man. Yeah. and so expensive. There was one place in Chicago yeah. underneath the L tracks yeah. that's like, yeah, Macfair. So, so Char- if Charlie Trotter was buying all that stuff from uh-huh. her, so I remember one time when uh, Helen calls me like one day, I'm like a young cook at the back, I have the weekend up. He's like, hey, Shola, I have a chef who's in town. He's doing an event of the Four Seasons and he needs like extra hands to help plate the food. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh yeah, sure, I'll go. I have nothing to do. I'll plate food at the Four Seasons. I'm like, who's the chef? Charlie Porter. I'm like, what, are you serious? Wow. like, yeah. She's like, yeah. So anyway, she's like, yeah. I'm like, well, what do I need to do? He's like, just go to the Four Seasons, uh, ask for Matt Mergers. I'm like, I didn't know who Matthias Merges was. I just uh-huh. showed up. I met this guy. Hey, I'm here from Previn. I work on the back. He's like, all right, quick, stand here. There's like a long ass table. There's like uh-huh. eight people on either side. At the front of the table was like, there were two tables. One table had Matt Merges. The other had Bill Kim. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were like, and Bill was like super mercenary, mm-hmm. like, you know, chairman of the joint chips. Yeah. No smiling. Right. Yeah, no smiling, just no nothing. Like, you, how much you? You, Morel Emulsion. You, uh-huh. sauce. Yeah. Phone, boom, boom. And mm. it was just been passed then and it was just amazing to yeah. see like, I'm like, you guys do this shit every day. <laughs> every day, every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what made me say like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. I should really actually consider. Cause it was even more crazy on the back. I was like, this yeah. is nuts, uh-huh. you know? It's like a Formula One pit stop. Car rolls in four times <laughs> or up, and full it's of gone. gas, yeah. six and a half do seconds, again. if more, cut. Yeah, do that 200 times. <laughs> I, think, um, I think a lot about Charlie more so now than I did on his later years of after closing. Yeah. He was uh, super influential in Chicago oh my for, for putting cuisine on the map. Yeah. He was the restaurant everybody always talked about. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to eat there three times um, at different stages in my life. So I got to see the progression of, of Charlie Trotter and yeah. the progression of my own self. Yeah. And then, you know, the molecular gastronomy thing came by. He had a stance on it. 
um, he, he started to get knocked off with stars. He, he started to kind of like, I don't want to say lose control of the restaurant, but he, he started seemed very disinterested right. in it with the way, not disinterested with the restaurant or what he was doing, but just the way the industry was going. Yeah. The, 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 the TV, the top mm -hmm. chef, yeah. you know, um, um, the Muckler gastronomy. And then the restaurant closed and, you know, and he passed away. And we started talking about him again. We passed away. But I think now, I think, History is going to look so fondly on him. Absolutely. And it's going to pay such an homage to him. Absolutely. And it's going to have this, the movie coming out pretty soon. Yeah. There's going to be this rebirth What's of. That Ray is doing. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be this rebirth of the impact he had on what we eat today yeah. and how we dine today yeah. came from that guy yeah. in 1982 when yeah. he opened his restaurant. You know, yeah. or 80, I don't know, 82, uh, whenever I, it opened. I, you yeah. know, and it's, it's really sad for me because we, that's one thing I've never understood because at the same time, the other restaurant that was extremely resistant and still is till today to molecular gastronomy is the French Laundry. Yeah. And it's grown in bounds and leaps and it's still kind of, you know, I will go there tomorrow and eat the oysters and pearls. Totally. Anytime. Anytime. You know, Anytime. Yeah. You know yeah. any of that food, the ice cream cone with salmon, mm -hmm. it's delicious. Right. It's so good. There's you a know? place for that, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think um, one of the cooks in the French Laundry, I think it was, they were like, uh, with the Noma and foraging and... They said Thomas just wants to be known for these flavors. This is what he's passionate about. Yeah. Like he's not going to change the whole concept right. because right now it's trendy to, right. to 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 cook new Nordic cuisine. And yeah. there's a lot of um, there's a lot of honor in that, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just kind of bending and swaying to whatever the popular belief right. or what people think they exactly. should. Exactly. Christopher for. Costo was doing the same thing at Meadowood. Yeah. New Napa Great cuisine. chef. They Great just chef. figure out what they can get and mm -hmm. what they can cook. But also you're in Napa. You have all the best ingredients around you. Like That's there's right. no reason to add a quart of sugar to, to a peach. You, you have it sweet enough already. Let's go to Santa Rosa. Buy yeah. some plums. Buy some plums. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you, you launched Studio Kitchen. Yes. Um, what is it? So Studio Kitchen is kind of like basically my brain trust. It's not so much functionally. It's clearly not a restaurant. It's not like a food experience. It's just like a, a way of thinking, you know, which is why those two words come together. Studio Kitchen. Mm -hmm. Probably the smartest thing I ever did was trademark that word and buy the website immediately. Yeah. Because I've gotten offers that would, at the beginning, allow me to buy like a mini Cooper. But I think at this point, I'm up to a Range Rover potentially. Right on. There you go. <laughs> so, if someone wants it for like a 458 Italia, I'll take it. You know, mm -hmm. but <laughs> till then, I'll keep it. Uh, but it's kind of like to be like a hub of like my thinking, my ideas. It hasn't potentially probably reached its full uh, potential because I've only been focused on like pop-ups, creativity, collaborations. Uh, and uh, for many years, I had the Studio Kitchen blog, which mm -hmm. was what right. allowed me to be connected and to be humbly taken seriously by chefs who are like of much more repute than I am. You know, uh, at one point, the blog platform, Typepad, there were like five important food blogs, Ideas and Food, yep. uh, Alex Alba and Eric, uh, Ping Island Strike, which Ping. was uh, Sean Brock. Mm -hmm. It was like 1980, 1995. Yeah. Um, uh, Playing with Fire and Water, Linda, who was at that time was making like miso and koji and uh -huh. like nobody knew what. Nobody had doing. any idea. Yeah. Um, uh, Chad Galliano, who had like Chad Zilla, and then Studio Kitchen. And mm -hmm. we were all like sharing information. And we had all these young cooks from different restaurants. I remember the day I actually met Wiley Dufresne the first time. This is probably the nicest compliment I've ever gotten for Chef. He's like, I think you're amazing. It was. Introducing me to David Rosengarten, you know, the man who ate everything. He's like, yes. David, this is the best chef without a restaurant in America. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, seriously? Yeah. It's like, seriously. Like, every time we got a new stage at WD50, we gave him, like, all this stuff to do. We made sure they read your blog and Alex's blog and oh, all amazing. this other. Like, How that's cool amazing. is that? How that's, cool is that? That was yeah. just yeah, nice. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. not undeserving. So, Studio Kitchen became this creative thing that was sharing ideas and engaging in conversations and then evolving to building these relationships with manufacturers to sort of, I think I was like really the first person, not that I want to take credit for it, to kind of walk up to like a manufacturer of equipment. I'm like, all right, you guys have sales reps, you have equipment, you have restaurants. There's like no connection between the three. Yeah. Like nobody knows what a combi right. oven is right. or how to use it. Uh -huh. I, however, would want to be that guy who can just like say like, do this, do that, do that. Mm -hmm. And I never walked into anyone saying like, give me this. I was just like, 
here's what I can do for you. Here's what you can do for mm -hmm. me. I want that $26,000 piece of equipment. Yeah. I don't need to own it. I, I literally, it's not like I just had, I say, I don't need to own it. I came to people with a proposal. I'm like, you retain ownership. I'll, you write a contract, amortize it. When I'm done with it, you can take it and sell it for mm -hmm. like its amortization cost. Yes. And you still keep it and it's yours and we can work together. And when there's a new model, we can continue to do that. And that's how it works. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of chefs today who sort of want to do the whole ambassador thing don't understand that concept of like bringing something to the table as right. opposed to I'm important enough that you should just, just give, give it me, me something. Right. Yeah. There's yeah. no value in that Zero. for anyone. None. Zero. So that's how I've been able to be successful in building those relationships and having that conversation with people. You know, I don't need to own an oven that I'm going to have to move somewhere in mm -hmm. three years. Right. Let the manufacturer come and get come it. Come and get it. Hey, your oven's one. here. My you lease know? is up. Your oven's here. Come get it. Exactly. <laughs> so so I, I like building those and I continue to build those relationships and it's become fruitful. Now, as I've matured and I've, especially with the influence of the pandemic and just like the changes in the landscape of the restaurant industry, the restaurant culture, American society in general, you know, I've slowly been moving back to sort of like be focusing on my own cultural background mm -hmm. and putting my energy into that food. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I'm working on a food on a book proposal now for like a kind of modernized version of the food that I, I grew up with Nigerian flavors, yes. even though like I still have to litigate the frustration of every publisher or like every, you know, so many people in the public just unable to connect to like a micro level of African food without having to use the word Africa, you know, so it's kind of like a subtitle uh -huh. thing, you know, even if I feel as an African, like to write a cookbook that says new African flavors and I'm like focusing on just like my region of, you know. Nigeria would be like writing a cookbook that said new European flavors and I'm just making Basque food. Right, right, yeah. Like, wait, uh -huh. this is only Basque food. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's not like Correct. Europe. So, yeah. so from a word perspective, I'll let the, you know, the, the editors and publishers work on that. But I'm doing a good faith proposal on my idea of going back to Nigeria and using all of my knowledge gained from a technical aspect in the West and reconnecting it to the food of my childhood yeah. and I'm not doing one of this like kind of it's a difficult project I'm not doing one of this kind of like take Nigerian food put it on like fancy like stoneware yeah and right. like it's the same thing <laughs> no I'm making I'm taking like indigenous ingredients yeah especially with the when I we spoke earlier about the negative influences of western culture on West African food it's the bullion cube just loads of sodium yes. yeah. way too much MSG mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to its use but it's been used so prolifically and I think people are forgetting the fundamental flavors of food in its natural sense. What's used as an ingredient, not yes, enhanced. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So going back to that, from what Rene and David Zilber have allowed us to think more broadly about now taking like African ingredients, black eyed peas, different beans, tiger nuts, and making like either variations of shoyus or misos yes. or amino yes, paste yes, yes, yes. and adding that to the thing and then thinking broadly, even like adjusting ferments. Yep it allows you to come up with some interesting flavors mm -hmm. and some interesting ideas. Yeah, that's yeah. a great segue to my next. Yeah. Uh, during the pandemic, we've been friends for a while. Yes. I have so much respect for you. We have, every time I'm in Philly, I always hit you up. We always have a I meal. Appreciate we that. always yeah. have a conversation. Even I, in Bali. And even in, when in Bali, every time I'm in Bali or Philly, I always hit you up, uh, which was a special treat uh, seeing funny. you in Bali. Yeah. Um, we've been friends for a while, a lot of respect for you. And one day during the pandemic, I open up uh, Instagram and I see Blue Hill Stone Barn ah. is doing some special dinners and yeah. my friend Shola is going to be one of the guest chefs there. It was like a proud moment of like a father looking at a son or like seeing your friend, wow. you know, fi find a, a, a girl that you, you like or or, see, or, or or somebody like getting the job that they wanted or something happened in their life. I was just filled with so much joy for you and I was so excited because A, I have so much respect for what Dan Barber does and B, to see you on that platform and to see finally getting recognition, finally getting to have your voice and to talk about what you want and finally have a platform to be able to cook the food that you grew up eating. It was it was a great moment, I think, for our friendship. So how, how did that whole thing come about? That's funny, like, because it was such a pure coincidence. So if you go back to my whole, like, building this relationship with, like, tricky equipment manufacturers. One of the people in my roster was Thermomix. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like a Thermomix ambassador because I was working with the company. And during the pandemic, Thermomix is like, hey, we, you know, Lynette's like, we're going to do a live stream and like cooking session with Thermomix. You know, we figure out the place with the least restriction to do it. 
Salt Lake City, Utah. So I flew to Salt Lake City. Out of all the places. Exactly. <laughs> so they're like in Costa Mesa, California. Yeah, right, so right. it's easy for them to come and I came from there. So we met halfway in the country-ish. Mm -hmm. And then, so it was me and one other Thermomix ambassador. The other Thermomix ambassador was Bill Yosses. Bill Yosses had been the executive pastry chef for the White House for the end of the George W. Bush administration mm -hmm. and for most of the time that the Obamas were there. And then he had left after the Obama administration ended. He was in New York City. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill Yosses was involved in the beginning at Citarella. But Bill Yosses had also worked for David Boulay along with Dan Barber at the, I think, the original Boulay. Yeah. So they were very good friends. So I was in Salt Lake and Bill had heard about me. I was, I was doing, we were doing a lot of feminist stuff over three days. Like, I think you're amazing. I think you're really cool. And Bill has a kind of a foundation that's working on making healthier food for school kids in Ghana. And so he was very attuned to like issues in the West African continent. It's like, so my friend Dan is doing this like chef residency in upstate New York. This guy, Dan. <laughs> yeah. And I think he will be the best person to start it because I think it will be a great cultural connection. I'm like, yeah, sure. I'd love to talk to him. I didn't even ask anything at the time. I'm like, I'm going to have someone reach out to you. A few days later, I get a phone call from Dan Barber. Yeah. It's like, hey, Shola, I've read all the stuff about you. Hey, Shola, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Can you, <laughs> can you meet? Can you meet and come visit us and see what's if, if we can talk about this? And then it would it would have but then strangely at that time I had gone home from Utah and then my girlfriend at the time uh, had arranged a weekend getaway with some of her friends and we went right back to New York of all places, mm -hmm. hour north of Blue Hills. So like well, I'm in Rhinebeck. I come tomorrow morning. Yeah. So next day I get up at 6 a.m. I drive to Blue Hill. I roll in there. I get like the red carpet. Everyone's there. Bastian, you know, Nick, yeah, Zelly, everybody. Such a good dude, man. You know, yeah, yeah. Dan's there. They're like, you know, uh, you know, um, it was just insane. And they're like, they made me lunch. You know, I uh, looked at the like, all this pile of vegetables. Yeah. And like, uh -huh. you know, you know, uh, you know, it was just crazy because I know Dan Barber and I know like what the importance of Blue Hill. It's like like you get like this last minute invitation to the Vatican. The Pope's like, would you like some espresso? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I'll make it. You know, <laughs> you know, one yeah. tie on my jacket. You know? uh -huh. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's great. So they like throw all this stuff. Like, do you want to take any of this stuff with you? I'm like, I'll take all this stuff with mm -hmm. me. I'll just eat it. You know, but like, yeah, I can. So they I took some meat and like some vegetables and I just like tasted like blue. I was just like so blown away. And I agreed to do it. Yes. So I was like the first resident chef. Uh, and I did it what I think was also the best time because there was no template to go by. There were no rules. I could just do whatever mm -hmm. the hell I want. And they gave us maximum flexibility. The team was unbelievably supportive. Uh, I made so many new friends. I still go there like once every month and a half or months. You know, I, drive, I just drive up on like a day I have nothing to do. I did like a, three weeks ago. I just yeah. got in my car at 6 a.m., drove to Blue Hill. Walked around for like four hours, ate some food, bought some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Said hello to everybody. They're all happy to see me. I'm happy to see them. They're just amazing. And I just came back home. And I was home by six and I went to bed. That was oh. it. And I had a good time. I love that place. You yeah. Know? So that was, I would say, like the most important and really just amazing validation of my experiences as a cook. I agree. Because it's not something to, it's not something easy. I didn't, I didn't think I had the cap capacity despite the very strong support from both the front of the house mm -hmm. and the back of the house, if you're someone who's never had a restaurant, think of it in that context. You've never actually had your own restaurant. You're like a reasonably good cook. You understand what's going on. But like, that's very different from someone who says like, you know, here's the keys to a two Michelin right. star restaurant. Yeah, totally. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, no. Right. <laughs> what was your menu planning? How did, how did that work? The menu planning was really honestly fascinated by you know one of the most brilliant people at Blue Hill that I that you probably don't hear much from in terms of public knowledge Andrew Lusmore Andrew Lusmore at the time was kind of like the sourcing person of most of the grains ingredients mm -hmm. and like processes and things and Andrew just is such a good soul and he shows you like what your landscape of everything was he kind of understood enough about African cooking that he was able to lean on all the stuff that Glenn Roberts was doing in Anson Mills with the rice and the beans, things that were derivative of African cooking from like the low country, Gula Gichi cuisine. So I had all this stuff, you know, for the birds that I could get, the pheasant from Vermont, the beef from mm -hmm. Blue Hill, the pork. Right. So you couldn't have had a better landscape. So all I did was just interpret flavors of Nigeria into an idea that was not too abstract. 
but still respected the soul of its origins. Sure. And it was great. So it came pretty natural. Then. Came pretty natural, uh -huh. yeah. Because I had already been an engineer, I could kind of make a case for the ingredients I wanted to showcase and highlight. Yep. I was very lucky. Blue Hill at the time had like, it's the first time they had like, they mature goats. I'm like, yeah, we mm -hmm. goat all the time. Great, the yeah. That's in the goats too. Yeah. yeah. And then it actually kind of pushed your creativity. We couldn't figure out how to serve goat. I wanted to serve goat on the menu. I could figure out how to transfer goat to a two Michelin star restaurant because it's like, there's no actual cut you can serve. Yeah. If you yeah. did, it's not tender. Uh -huh. You can't do right. anything yep. with it. And I came up with this idea. So I, I got like a goat leg from Blue Hill and I just had this abstract idea in my mind and I was like, hmm, let's see if we can make this work. So I took it home. I like, almost like cooked it slow, made like a, a spice blend, make it on African, rubbed it, cured it for like a day. And then I cooked it slow, wrapped mm -hmm. in banana leaves, grilled and then finished bacon. And it was super tender. Yeah. So I came up with the idea to remove all the goat, separated the fat from the sinew, from the lean meat, chopped it all up separately. But without any addition of xanthan gum or any other gels, I combined it into like a sheet pan with a, get a wooden board cut, wrapped it in saran, pressed it mm -hmm. flat, heavyweight overnight. Yeah. So next day, I'm like, hopefully this works. Shook a sharp knife, cut it into exact, maybe one and a half by two inch rectangles. Yeah. Three quarter inch. Little pavé. Little pavé. Yeah. So I sauteed them, hopefully it crisp up, doesn't burn, flip it, finish it in the oven. No call Perfect. fat or anything? Just No call fat, yeah. nothing. Just a crispy goat confit mm -hmm. pavé. And it held. So I use that as a basis to build up the rest of the dish, which is to then make a goat stew. Yep. We have this like green that was called bao sin, which is almost like a Chinese cabbage that we could grill quickly. An intense goat sauce using African spices. And then like a creamy puree of like, I think it was both corn and or celery root at different points. And it was just fantastic. Sounds great. It had the flavors of Africa. It had yeah. the textures of winter. Remember, this is like January in the Hudson Valley. Totally. It's cold yeah. It's, it's far away. It's, as, life oh, is black and white. Exactly. <laughs> far away from Africa, you can get uh, temperature, <laughs> cold and like vegetation. Yeah. So it was just amazing. Uh -huh. I mean, Blue Hill in the summer, I mean, the winter, during the t daytime, if you ever seen the pictures of the restaurant, in Aubrac, Michel Bra, when the, you see that hillscape mm -hmm. with like, it looks like almost like an Ansel Adams. It's gorgeous. Photograph. Yeah, it looks it's fake. Amazing. It looks yeah. fake. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that formed the rest of the menu and it was, it was fun. You know, I had spent like about two to three months before the residency making like some condiments. I made like a three month show you using local mm -hmm. spins. It's young, but it was complex enough and interesting that we could use it, you know. Uh, pickled peanuts, did all this stuff. And it just became organically one of my fun experiences in terms of cooking. Yeah. Yeah. And how did it go? Was it a success? It was a success. Yeah. I mean, Dan just basically let me and the Blue Hill team let me do whatever Here I wanted. Here you go. Half the time. Yeah. They were very happy with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. What'd you learn from the experience? Oh my God. So many things. Just the idea of having fun and being loose, but also like the importance of ingredients and structure which I had known before, but like Blue Hill took it to a different level in yeah. terms of just having things at your disposal, yeah. you know, you know, and also not necessarily, you know, where to, you know, remember this was at the infancy of the pandemic. So we had kind of a restriction of only doing 30 dinners mm -hmm. a night, right? right. Yeah, you know, which was like great, you know, and also because you're like a, essentially a somewhat nonprofit, it was maximum creativity. Yeah. Like we're, we're not trying to make money here. We uh -huh. want to cook for 30 people yeah. every night as much as we can. What a special thing, man. Oh my God. Yeah. Even Blue Hill doesn't cook for 30 people. Totally. At all. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that's, when, that's I, not, when I was there, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize how big of a restaurant oh my it was. God. It was like the fucking kitchen's the like the size of Home like, Depot. Yeah, yeah the wedding exactly. upstairs. The whole yeah. wedding in Dressel Complex in yeah, the Hate yeah. which is a totally different uh -huh. thing, you know. That would just be a legit catering operation on its own, you know. Yeah. Drawing in like, you know, gajillions, but really wonderful people, a really amazing time, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Patrick the Baker, was one of the special parts of the experiences who would sit with you and transfer any idea you have from any culture. I think if you interviewed all of those residents, I would say that the most interesting thing that they would have come up with was the fact that Patrick was able to take what you thought was your own cultural sourced bread and uh -huh. do like a whole wheat, 100% whole wheat version That's of amazing. it. Amazing, wow. In a, in a farm, where there was like, you know, uh, me, Omar Tate, who was doing soul food, uh, what's her name for Victoria. my- Victoria. Victoria yeah. from Chile, mm -hmm. you know, Chilean food. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from Great. Mexico City, Quinto Neal, you know, yeah. uh, yeah. Johnny Ortiz from New Mexico. Uh -huh. And so there's this like, they should do like a, a bread. I came up with the term bre residency. <laughs> <laughs> it was like all these breads of the residency. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> 
we'll put that with the sauce industrial exactly. complex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what's next for you? What's next? So I'm kind of actually seriously like working on this book proposal. For, mm-hmm. And so in sometime in the December into January, I'm actually going to take another 10 day trip to Nigeria. Excellent. This time a little bit more focused on like uh, food sourcing than family reunion, because when I got there the last time being away for so long, I'd sort of for, forgotten what was plausible, plausibly allowed to be included in creating modern West African cuisine. So now I, I've got this expanded landscape of like, Mangoes. Mangoes then mean mango leaves. They also mean green mangoes, dried green mangoes, which is amateur yeah. in India. Yeah. So now I have a source of astringency and I can not, I can say I'm not using Indian ingredients. This stuff like literally right. goes here. Right. Banana leaves. Tons of different citruses, mm-hmm. almost like in the Hawaiian context, not so much the Japanese. Right. But like interesting citruses that have great acidic flavor uh-huh. while they're green. So if you start to think about like things that may not be intrinsically Nigerian, if you look at the concept of Leche de Tigre, mm-hmm. ceviche in Mexico, Agua Chile, all that stuff, yeah. there's a lot of interesting concepts I can do with native ingredients. So I'm just going with a big notebook, a nice camera, and going to markets and sourcing and tasting and playing around. Yeah. Sounds epic. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I think we'll end on that note. Yeah. That was fantastic. It was um, a pleasure speaking with you. Thank Thanks you, for Ryan. taking time out of your day. You're, you're it's uh, it's, Thank it's you. great to get to know you. Even fantastic. Better. Excellent. Thanks. Cheers.